to the Bean Movie Cryptcast, the podcast where we explore the dark and twisted world of horror cinema. I'm your host, Mr. Hyde, and with me is my co-host, the Horror Chick. Hello. Uh, hopefully everybody's having a, uh, a, a good day, fun evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, and before we start, I just wanted to say a little reminder, if you haven't yet um, watched this movie um, on our other channel, there will be some spoilers in this podcast, so um, if you don't want to be spoiled, we suggest that you go and check out the films first and then come back and enjoy the show. If spoilers, you, you don't mind spoilers, you've already seen the movies, then happy days. We'll uh, crack on. And today we are going to talk about the Trolling Bird Terror, a.k.a. the Crawling Eye in American uh, audiences. And later on, we'll be talking about the classic Walt Disney movie, the Strange Monster of Strawberry Cove, with two fantastic actors. Um, and who are they? Burgess uh, Meredith. Oh, yes. And, um, and uh, oh, crap. Uh, what's her name? She was in Bewitched. Oh, Agnes Moorhead. Right. Yes, right. Agnes yeah. Moorhead. You oh, totally man. threw me a curve there because <laughs> I didn't think we were going to talk about that one right away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, she's, yeah, I look forward to talking about that one at the end. That's like a little dessert film. You know, we, we've got the main, we've got the main event, the Trollenberg mm -hmm. Terror, and then you go 360 degrees or whenever you know you go the complete opposite and then you have this lovely dessert sweet yep. film that is uh equally entertaining yeah so yeah i look forward to chatting it's about a that yeah. a walt disney treasure it is it is yeah so the trolling bar terror is one of your favorite movies yeah it definitely is uh grew up with it it's just carved a place in my memory. It opened the door to me, uh, along with George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead, to the world of horror movies, and I never looked back. This movie, for the time that it was made as well, even though there were a lot of, you know, science fiction, horror slash, you know, adventure movies made around this time, this one really stands out for me for a lot of reasons, which we'll we'll get into in a bit. So, what what about it? How when did you first see this movie, and and what were your big takeaways? I think I was a teenager when I first saw this one, and the eyes scared the crap right out of me. <laughs> there's this, there's the scene where towards the end, when the um the the, the, the creatures are attacking the um the station. Mm -hmm. what that they're in in the one wall is is busted out and you see this eye on the other side of the wall and i know the I, scene. Remember, I remember thinking oh my god and they're throwing molotov cocktails at the eye and i'm thinking oh my eye, my eye. <laughs> anything to do with eyes terrifies the ever-living shit out of me like, <laughs> movies for eyes like a clockwork orange can't watch it because it seems oh, like the thing yeah on Oh, I know. I can't. No, I don't like stuff like that myself. This one didn't affect me in in that way with regard to the eye. I found the monster in this very effective because of the eye. And because they, even though it's a, it's a long buildup before you actually see the monster, once once it comes down the mountain and that opening scene that first scene rather when you when you first see it where they've all evacuated the lodge and they've gone up in the cable car and they've gone to the observatory and just in time and the monster bursts the 
the the doors open and you see it for the first time with that eyeball looking at you and all the tentacles and everything i lost my flipping mind i thought i thought that was probably the most scary thing at the time but i was also in absolute love <laughs> i was like this is a monster this is how you do it um it it really really creeped me out but i thought it was just so well done and it there's something about that eyeball that makes it i don't know it, it made it feel more real yeah. i don't know what it is but it 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 really stands out plus when before you get to that scene of like that reveal there's that perfect tension that's in the movie with the um what do you call those uh the things that they're in the lifts in the cape yeah the you know, cable car yeah, the cable cars yeah there's that whole build up you know mm -hmm. are they going to be uh attacked when they're in the um this cable are they going to make it yeah the the you mechanism make... starts to freeze because it, yeah, yeah, it yeah. you know these these alien monsters bring this intense cold with them it it's it as you said it it builds a perfect tension um, in even we do wait a while to see the actual monster, I thought the story was pretty well done. It keeps it keeps your attention interested in the characters. They're interesting characters. They're uh, well cast. I thought Forrest Tucker plays his character so well, and he's he's the quintessential. Uh, action man uh dashing male lead you know mm -hmm. and i have got no issues with that at all i this was made at a time when you know it, it was the late the late 50s and the women were very much how what's the word i'm looking for they were they were quite intelligent but they were they weren't going to get in the middle of any big fights or anything like that. The men just sort of jumped in and took care of that. And again, it's it's the time that it was made. I have absolutely no issue with it. And I I love looking back at that time um, in 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 movies like this where we get to see the positive elements of it. Yep, there were definitely negative elements where you know women didn't have. Uh, the rights that they have today but mm -hmm. when i watch movies like this my brain just doesn't go anywhere near that i just enjoy myself again it it shows the more positive elements of that time the men were dashing they were very uh, uh what's the word heroic the i do have a favorite character in this actually which i'll see if it's the same one that you have but there is a, an actor in this that I never knew at the time, but who's very, very well known here in the UK because he played Alf Garnet, which uh, in the United States, the Alf Garnet character was translated into Archie Bunker oh, yeah. for All in the Family. I'm just going down to my cast, and the actor is named Warren Mitchell, very well-known actor uh, in the UK, and he played Professor Krevet, and he was so prof professorial, wasn't he? <laughs> he just yeah. he just had the accent, and he had the mannerisms, and he had the crazy professor hair. He was great. I yep. really enjoyed him. <laughs> wow. I really enjoyed him. Well, I, the uh, it's definitely a this movie is definitely a product of its time. Mm. And like you said, if they remade this today, when um, when what's your name is in the in a little bar scene, um, Anne Pilgrim played by mm -hmm. Janet, Monroe, yeah. and the one guy begins to attack her. If the mm -hmm. movie was done today, she'd be out there kicking ass. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah, and quite rightly so. Fun. Quite you know, yeah. quite rightly so instead of standing back and letting the the men do the job <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly i i find movies like this more charming because there wasn't 
there was they weren't insulting the women mm -hmm. in it they were everybody was quite comfortable with who they were in this movie and that's what i liked there was no tension or you know arguing back and forth it, on those types of subjects and i have to say the actress janet monroe she looks so much like judy garland to me mm -hmm. yep. like a really young judy garland i was so amazed and what a beautiful girl i mean she just had the most stunning features the both both of the ladies that were in this were beautiful but Jana Monroe in particular really struck me because I kept thinking of um, Judy Garland. Judy Garland. Every time I looked at her, <laughs> a total brain fart there. <laughs> and I'm old. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. there were some. There's there's good cast all the way through this. The guy that goes a bit crazy, or actually, the the scene where they're the two men go up to the they go up the mountain and they're in that mountain cabin and one of them suddenly you can tell like the creatures are like contacting him and he goes outside in this fog and he disappears but when he comes back he's like a killing machine he like kills the other men that that come up there mm -hmm. and then he goes down and he tries to attack Anne. he was extremely good he had a real menacing look about him. Mm -hmm. And then when he gets clocked and uh, he hits his head and there's like no blood and stuff like that. That was yeah, that was quite creepy. It was. It was It was very creepy. And then when he comes back, he's already dead technically, but he, he sort of comes back to life. You almost have like a bit of a zombie vibe going on, you know, because he comes back to life again and he goes after Anne again and they almost don't get there in time. Mm -hmm. but it builds that tension very well in those scenes. So I, I was quite impressed, you know, for the time that this was made, that it, it, it just had a nice, it had nice pacing. It just moved along quite well. The reception was a little bit mixed. Um, it says in January, 1959 issue of the New York times film critic, Richard W. Nason reviewed the double feature starring Forrest Tucker and opined that the crawling eye and the cosmic monsters do nothing to enhance or advance the copious genre of science fiction. So not a fan there. Film historian and critic Leonard Maltin considered the Trollenberg terror as quote, okay, if predictable, a feature that showed its humble origins being adapted by Jimmy Sangster from the British TV series, also called the Trollenberg terror about cloud hiding alien invaders on a Swiss mountaintop. Malton noted that the film was quote, hampered by low grade special effects. Now I get that some of the effects are obviously models, but that didn't really put me off. That didn't really take me out of it in this particular instance. I thought the monsters were really good and I, I thought they did a pretty good job really considering when it was made mm -hmm. and you're, you're talking to a guy who enjoys the rubber suit monsters you know like you know going back we mentioned a, a lot you know classic doctor who you know but that, that's my that's my kind of jam i love I, I don't like the cgi effects of today give give me rubber suits you know where you can see the person's eyes and in them stuff like that that's my kind of i love that stuff yeah, like the original Zygons from uh, Doctor Who, too. They were they were awesome. One of the things that struck me when I was watching this movie is the fog, the element of the fog, I always thought was so scary. And I thought to myself when I was watching, I thought, you know, that kind of reminds me of John Carpenter's The Fog. Mm -hmm. And reading in Wik Wiki... <clears throat> It actually says the Trollenberg Terror was one of the inspirations for writer-director John Carpenter's 1980 horror film, The Fog. So if, if that is, if that is uh, the case, that, that is pretty cool because that is, because I saw this for the first time so, so, so many years ago, I can still remember those elements. The fog was one and the big eyeball mm -hmm. through the doorway. Those were like the two main things that really stuck out 
So it goes to show how impactful this movie was. And, you know, then we end up with something as awesome as The Fog many years later. So yeah. I think it's pretty cool. I wonder if this movie was actually an influence on classic Doctor Who with the character of um, Alpha Centauri in the Paladon series. I'm, oh, I'm God, the monster of Paladon. <laughs> uh, big eye. I <laughs> know. Poor old, poor, <laughs> <laughs> poor old Alpha Centauri. Oh, God. I, Doctor Who can do no wrong in my eyes, but oh, my God, that was horrible. That <laughs> That was just that was painful. Alpha Centauri's mm -hmm. one of the one of the ones who were just like, yeah, okay, we'll just move that yeah. one under the carpet. <laughs> the, the, the the voice is grated on my nerves. Oh god! Anyways, if you if you're listening, guys, and you don't know what we're talking about, look up Doctor Who, Planet, uh, no Curse of Paladon, and then later on Monster of Paladon. Yes, Alpha Centauri. The Alpha Centauri. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can't remember then who did the name for that one, but yeah, I guess think she returned too for one of Matt Smith's episodes, I believe. Oh God, yeah, I have to go back and check that. And uh, another uh, influence, I think, the way that um, the eye creatures in this glided on the on the floor or on the ground rather, kind of reminded me of the Rutan in um, Horror of Fang Rock. Yeah, yep, yeah. he did. Like a like a larger version of him. Yeah, and we it's funny, we were just talking about Fang Rock uh on mm -hmm. Discord earlier, and that's another awesome Doctor Who episode from an era that is is one of my all-time favorites. Because yeah. it's got that horror okay. edge to it. Yeah, horror Fang Rock's my all-time favorite Doctor Who episode. Yeah, it's in my top five. It's definitely in my top five. I love it. Um Getting back to the crawling eye, there's some other interesting popular culture um, bits and pieces that I found. Um, the main music for the crawling eye was featured on the album Greatest Science Fiction Hits 5 by Neil Norman and his Cosmic Orchestra, released in 1979 on GNP Crescendo Records. In Stephen King's 1986 horror novel, It, one of the protagonists, Richie Tozier, watches the film and it terrifies him. A crawling eye creature later appears as a manifestation of it, the novel's title monster. Mm -hmm. Also, under the title of The Crawling Eye, the film was the first of many productions to be mocked on the TV series Mystery Science Theater 3000 after mm -hmm. the series moved from KTMA to Comedy Central. The episode aired on 11th of November, 1989, it was also briefly mentioned at the end of the season 10 finale, the original series finale covering Danger Diabolique. Not familiar with that one. The, this goes to show how uh, impactful this movie was on popular culture. Mm -hmm. It goes yeah. on. Um, the Freakazoid episode called The Cloud spoofed the opening credits of the film and key elements of the plot though with the victims being turned into clowns instead of being killed. <laughs> <laughs> a song called The Crawling Eye was featured on American horror punk band The Misfits 1999 album Famous Monsters. The song's lyrics directly referenced the plot of the film. The film was also shown on the Me TV show Svenguli on 26 of November 2022. And finally... In the 2023 Riverdale episode, quote, Betty and Veronica double digest, a 4D screening of the film is held to increase popularity of a financially struggling movie theater. <laughs> <laughs> so holy cow, I didn't even realize there was that much of an impact on many other yeah, bits of pop culture. So that's really cool. Hmm. Yeah. And then with the production, it says that it was shot at South Hall Studios, uh, one of the earliest pioneer film studios in the uh, United Kingdom. And was one of the last films released by Distributors Corporation of America. Mm -hmm. Mitchell's role was originally meant to be played by Anton Differing, but Differing pulled out at the last minute. Oh, interesting. Mm hmm. Mm. 
And I wanted so, to touch up on um hold on, let me I wanted to touch up on um oh my god. Drum roll. Drum roll, please. <laughs> <laughs> Once the lights go out, one go ball goes out, they all go out, Clark. <laughs> <laughs> um, Les Bowie, who did the special effects, he mm -hmm. was a, a Canadian um, special effects artist working mainly in Britain. Uh, his career as a matte painter in 1946 found places in classic films such as The Great Expectations, Oliver Twist, in The Red Shoes. And he created his own company in 1951, worked freelance on projects for relatively low budget studios such as Hammer Films. Um, hmm. So he did the Quarter Mass Experiment, Dracula, 1958, Kiss of the Vampire, which we did on our show. Yeah. Um, the Outmost Films of Attack on the Iron Coast, Submarine X, uh, Sinbad in the Eye of the Tiger with uh, Ray Harryhausen. Oh, the and, wonderful Ray Harryhausen. Uh, mm. And he won an Oscar for his work on the 1978 film Superman. Um, in his wow. Film. Yeah. So, yeah. What, what a CV. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. cool. Very cool. So, yeah, it's... um. And he passed yeah. away in 1979, which I believe was two years after Superman. Because Superman hmm. was what, 77, wasn't it? I think. Oh, I'd have to check that. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, Sounds right. about right. I, yeah, 77, 79, something like that. But anyways, yeah, so that's, um, yeah, the Trolling Bird Terror. Um, I've got a couple other notes here, too. Mm -hmm. Uh, the uh, the color trend because we watched the colored version because mm -hmm. the, uh, the black and white version that I have and the ones that are available to watch there was some uh, like it, they get it, a bit it, muddy don't they they get a bit yeah, they, fuzzy yeah. and muddy yeah yeah they needed the short some love so uh, they, I like the color transfer I thought it was it added to the the creepiness. You know what? I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about that because I've only seen this film in black and white, but I really did enjoy it. I was I surprised myself because I wasn't so sure. And yet I kind of forgot that I was watching it in color because I got so involved in the movie. I was just away. And then I thought to myself, yeah, that wasn't so bad, actually. I, I I'm pleased about that. And you mentioned this earlier. Forrest Tucker really commanded the screen as Alan mm -hmm. Brooks. And Anne Pilgrim was a fascinating character, played by the wonderful Janet Monroe. Mm -hmm. uh, and Monroe is in three Disney classic movies. Um, Daryl O'Grill in The Little People, Third mm -hmm. Man on the Mountain, and the Swiss Family Robinson. Which I think is the most popular one that people yes. remember. Yes, yes, yeah. And sadly, she she died at an early age. It was like thirty eight oh years gosh, old. Oh my gosh! Yeah, she died of a heart attack at thirty eight. Wow. What shame! Yeah, her career was just starting to to take off too. I yeah, think. and she was also in the day the Earth caught fire in nineteen sixty one. So that is amazing. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. So all in all, I think, you know, for our ratings, I give this one a 10 out of 10. Instant 10 out of 10 for me, because I just love this movie so much. Yeah. And I think it earns it. I think it earns it. And it, it, it stood the test of time, too, because, you know, you could watch it today and, and still love it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a 1950s so movie. You know, that is what it is. And you, you just get immersed in that world. And you care about the characters. At least I did. I, yep. I I really enjoyed it. And again, Forrest Whitaker was a really, really great leading man. Yes, he was. Yeah. All right. So we're moving on to The Strange Monster of Strawberry Cove. 1971 <laughs> 
tell them um, film <clears throat> movie produced by Walt Disney Productions being broadcast on NBC as a two part episode on the wonderful world of Disney on October 31st and November 7th, 1971. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I really enjoyed this. I. I haven't seen a Disney movie like this, like going all the way back when this was made in decades. So I was watching it back now. You, the, the video quality is pretty poor. It's mm -hmm. a little, it, it's a little bit frustrating, but you just have to push past that and just enjoy the story. And I just thought this was, was very charming. It has some very funny scenes in it, mostly with Agnes Moorhead, because she she's she's so funny. She's such a diva. Mm -hmm. And she's she can put her talents to any type of character. We've seen her play all sorts of different characters, haven't we? We we watched her, mm -hmm. um, I think it was the bat. Yep. We know her as Samantha's um mother from mother? bewitched in bewitched yes mm -hmm. and and obviously many many other films that she's done she has wonderful bearing and screen presence and in this i i was i was rolling i was just rolling on the floor because she's she's absolutely batshit in this movie <laughs> Yes, yeah. <laughs> but she's she's funny. She is really funny. Um, in go ahead. I was going to say she plays Mrs. Pringle. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. The notes that I made on this movie, I, I I made them as I was sort of watching it through. But before I I go into the notes, I will say that. The other cast in this is also wonderful. You have the wonderful Burgess Meredith as the lead who plays teacher Henry Mead. Agnes Moorhead, as we've said, you have Larry D. Mann as a character by the name of Helper, Parley Bear as the mayor, Skip Holmier as Harry, Bill Zuckert as Sheriff Wiley, who incidentally was in the original Star Trek story, Spectre of the Gun. Mm -hmm. Kelly Thord Thordson as Tiny, Annie McVitie as Tippy, the names the names cracked me up. Jimmy Bracken as Scott and Patrick Kramer as Catfish, and then Bob Hastings as Deputy Tom Martin. And so many of these faces of some of these actors immediately jumped out at me as seeing them in one thing or another over the years. So it was just a really nice. It was just really nice to see their faces. And see them popping up in this. It was fun. So my notes on this, uh, there was an, a scene in the beginning where Burgess Meredith is in his classroom and he's teaching <laughs> and he makes this, this lad stand up in front of the class and read poetry. And in my notes, I wrote making kids read poetry in front of their peers is basically child abuse. <laughs> 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 I thought, oh my god, that poor kid. I would have died a thousand deaths if I'd had to do that. Um, Agnes Moorhead, I have in my notes, batshit bossy bird lady, which pretty much sums her up. The one scene that really cracked me up was when she's out on the camping trip with them, where they well, they go out on the field trip and they you know they camp overnight and she's she's trying to she she's showing off on her bird knowledge and she has this bird call device and she starts making these silly bird calls and then one of the kids it, the camera goes to a couple of the boys you know and the one says to the other i bet it's a buzzard i bet it's going to be a buzzard and sure enough this buzzard comes down and answers the bird call and it was hilarious yeah. it was a great yeah. funny moment yeah, the look on her face Oh, yeah, the look on her face. She can pull some great faces as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fantastic actor. She won one of my favorite horror movies, um, Don't Cry, Sweet, Sweet Charlotte, with 
um, Betty Davis. Yeah, she she is. She is one of the all time greats as far as I'm concerned. Really love her. Um, the, as the movie goes on, however, you do find it very difficult to find her very charming because she turns into an absolute horror yeah. show herself, an absolute <laughs> bitch, what she does to poor Burgess Meredith's character. Mm -hmm. I, I really hated her character after that. I was just like, ah, oh, God. And then the uh, the kids in this are very cute they're very wholesome they're they're not bad actors for child actors at the time you know it 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 comes over fairly well and then mm -hmm. and then i saw the dog and then i was just like <laughs> anything happens to that dog i'm gonna need a new telly <laughs> because tramp was the star of the program <laughs> he was he was for me. I was like, okay, mm -hmm. I don't care about anybody else in this movie right now. The dog has to live. I'm just saying. <laughs> the dog better live or I'm going to need a new telly. <laughs> and then I kept reminding myself, it's a Disney movie. Dog's going to be okay. It's cool. This is not old yeller. This dog's going to be all right. I was like, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm counting on you, Disney. <laughs> do not <laughs> hurt that dog. And then when the, when the smuggler takes the dog away from him and takes the dog on the boat, I, I would have gone mental. I, I'm sorry. He would have been eating, no. he would have been drinking from a straw for a long time if he tried to take that <laughs> off me. The, the tramp, champ should have gotten a best a supporting actor role for uh, our Oscar for, for his performance. Because just for his ears. If it wasn't for Tramp, they wouldn't have. Yeah, just for his ears. <laughs> but it wasn't for his barking and his yelping while he was inside the monster. They wouldn't have uh, they wouldn't have caught the baddies. I know. And I was so worried because the monster's sinking and I'm thinking, he's in there. He's in there. And I'm like, I don't give a shit about the smugglers. <laughs> like, just, I just want to see <laughs> Tramp. I want to see he's okay. Everything's good. All right. <laughs> So the there was a line apparently called there was a line about an indigenous bird which cracked me up and I think it was a you know it was sort of a joke reference uh, back at Agnes Moorhead's character but the best thing in the whole movie was Burgess Meredith's character gets redeemed mm -hmm. they all you know, they he gets his job back. And at the very end, there's a great moment where Agnes Moorhead's character, Mrs. Pringle, comes sort of slinking around, you know, trying to trying to like ignore what she's done and try and get back in his good graces for for clout, you know, and he just shuts her right down. That was great. Yep. And then he walks away, Dan. Does a little bump in his step and <laughs> he's happy with himself. <laughs> that was great. That was great. This this was a great little dessert movie to watch. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And a good old Disney happy ending. And the music, I almost cried. I, I heard the original Disney movie music theme at the end. Mm -hmm. And I used to watch The Wonderful World of Disney with my dad. Right, yep. it was. I think it was right after Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, yes, which was yep. one of our favorite things to watch. And I remember watching both of those with my family, and particularly my dad and I just loved Wild Kingdom. And then we'd all watch Disney after, and it was just a nice little. It was nice to go back in time and sort of remember that. That was a, it was a really special time. Mm -hmm. Really cool. In one one of my favorites from the wonderful world of Disney, I have on my channel called the Mystery in Dracula's Castle. Ooh. I remember watching that one when I was a kid, and I was just like, "Oh my god!" It was a trip down memory's lane with that one. Oh, definitely, yeah. I totally need to watch that one. 
there was one final thing. Um, there was one of the children was called Tippy, and mm -hmm. the actress that was playing her. If I can open my my page, which I linked to. Hello, internet. Yes, there she is. She seems to have acting credits, but mostly she went into camera. She went into camera work. Hmm. And if you look at her IMDb, most of her credits are actually camera operators, first assistant camera, second unit, uh, B camera, all different types of camera operator roles. And so it was kind of cool to see that she she had done a little bit of acting, but she obviously got found her niche in in the camera, the camera work behind behind the scenes. And I thought that was pretty cool. You don't see that every day. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was cool. Um. I don't think we actually talked about the synopsis for this one, for anybody who hasn't seen this one yet. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. We, um, I'm just going back. You were so excited to talk about this one. We just went ahead and started. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it was so cute. Do you want to do that or do you want me to do yeah, it? So it says during a class overnight camping trip, we love school teacher Henry Mead, played by Burgess Meredith makes an odd shape or makes out make makes oh where you go mistakes <laughs> an odd shape on the lake uh, for a sea monster unintentionally frightening some of the children and rousing the concern of town the busybody mrs pringle gossip mm -hmm. of meat seeing things quickly spreads across the town and pringle rallies the committee demand meets re to retract his sea monster story or else be deemed unfit to continue working at the school. Wishing mm -hmm. to defend their teacher, a trio of Tippy, Scott, Catfish, and Tramp. Um, it doesn't mention the dog, but the dog's the key uh, key person on this one. Oh, yeah. Determined they, yeah. Can, <laughs> yeah, determined they can help creating a sea monster of their own, planning a homespun construction in an eventual trip along the lake. The trio of kids inadvertently encounter smugglers hiding their loot in an old shack near the cove. And after a close encounter, soon involved the police. The trio stage a misty morning voyage on their pedal-powered sea monster, and Mead excitedly takes several photos. Before he can have them developed, Mead is knocked unconscious and robbed of his camera. Yeah, that well, was pretty violent. Yeah. Yeah. That was pretty violent for a Disney movie back then. I was like, damn. Yeah. It was quite a wallop. Mm -hmm. uh, while Mead's camera is found, uh, the film has been stolen from the, from the, the, the camera, uh, renewing the mystery of his outlandish story. Pringle believes Mead falsified the robbery in order to win sympathy for himself. What do you do? Crack himself in the skull with a lead pipe or something? Uh, yeah, are these people stupid or what? <laughs> <laughs> and then and then she renews her petition for the teacher's resignation, despite repeated ad dominations from the local police. The trio of kids grow increasingly bold with their regard for the actual mystery of the smuggling operation along the cove. Uh, eventually, the two smugglers commandeer the sea monster with poor um, with poor Tramp and inadvertently sink the contraption and probably find themselves under arrest. The trio of kids provide additional clues to unmask the smuggling mastermind with Mead offering heroic support, ultimately restoring his honorable reputation. Yeah. So and neat. everybody loves Burgess Meredith. He you just want him to to succeed. He's such a charming, he was such a charming man, a charming actor. And I never I'll never forget his Twilight Zone episode. It always breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> where, yep. You know the one. Mm -hmm. Where he's always yep. he never has time to read his books. And then he suddenly finds that he has all the time in the world, and then something awful happens. Mm -hmm. And if anyone else has seen that Twilight Zone episode, you know exactly what I mean. But if you haven't seen it, it's well worth a watch. But it is it is a tough watch. Yeah. 
So yeah, he's one of my favorite actors, and he's obviously he was in Rocky uh, with mm. Sylvester Stallone. So he's 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 played obviously so so many roles over the years. He's so well known to so many people, very beloved, yeah. and he and he is you know he was another one of those actors that could turn his hand to so many different types of roles, comedy. Yeah. He was quite versatile. He was drama, all sorts of different things. So, yeah, great actor. Penguin in Batman. Yes, of course. Yes. I used to love watching that after school. And he was also in, um, oh, my God. I yeah. had it. It was right there on the tip of my tongue because <laughs> it, it was a Clash of the Titans. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah I loved that movie. Love that movie too. Yeah, that's a great movie. So I, I found out this was hard to critique something, you know, that's aimed at a kid's movie. <laughs> but mm -hmm. the, the one thing that I can say is that alligator would have snapped one of them kids up or take <laughs> yeah. a cramp. You know what I mean? You can't, it would yeah, not have then... just like moved away quietly. <laughs> yeah. So. One of those kids yeah. would have been alligator poop. Um, in the parents of these kids, you only see them once, the whole thing. They're running on any of these adventures late at night. Mm -hmm. But the parents are never involved. So, you know, it's like, really? The parents don't care about the kids? <laughs> I know. It was a little bit of a stretch. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, is it... um, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, keep going. Um, they weren't, weren't they? Um, they weren't very good at backing that monster up, too. <laughs> there was no... Uh, oh. you know, the girl was horrible at directions. Go straight. Oh, wait. Watch out. Go straight. Oh, watch out. <laughs> I yeah. That was and I actually thought, you know, when they were doing their little A-team moment, you know, where they're, like, making the dinosaur, I was like, really? <laughs> You're gonna... That was a pretty impressive-looking dinosaur <laughs> out of a bunch of old crap they found on the on yeah. the pier, you know? That was that was good when they, were, when they were in that shop wolfing down those um, ice cream floats all i can think of was holy brain freeze <laughs> yeah you're immune to those though when you're that age yeah <laughs> so yeah, i just found that's, that's, yeah. yeah just in in closing i just found an interesting thing i never knew about burgess meredith just um having a, a peruse of his imdb he was apparently fascinated by the subject of non-human intelligence, particularly dolphins. Yay, I love him. He once <laughs> believed that a dolphin somehow called him for help in the middle of the night while he was staying at a friend's home on the beach. He ran out and found the dolphin caught in a net under a dock down the beach. Although there was no way he could have known that it was there, he released it, saving its life. He believed it had made some sort of connection with him, perhaps telepathically, to call for help. How freaking cool is that? That's freaking awesome. I love him even more for that. That is so cool. I yes. never, ever knew that about him. That is just so, so cool. Yeah, he's a wonderful actor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. All right. Well, I think there, that, we um, there we go. Another uh, our fourth episode down, and uh, we'll see everybody next week on the BBB Cinema Show when we start our December uh, <laughs> trilogy. December, December. Yeah, it's the December December when we uh, watch um, uh, what it's uh, Black Christmas. Yes. <laughs> That's my kind of Christmas movie. <laughs> yeah, hard to believe the season's almost over, eh? It's come out fast. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah, we've got um, three movies coming up for December. And um, then that's it for a season. So, look forward and to uh, bringing you our dark Christmas. Yes, I love me a dark Christmas. So thanks, everybody, for uh, checking out another podcast. And we'll see you next time. Yes. Take care, everybody.